Number 50. We now come to the reason that we gather on the first day of the week. And I like Luke's account of the Passover in verse in Luke 22, verse 15, it says, and this is Jesus' words, and he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Our intent, our faith, is what makes the difference in everything we do as Christians. And we should have desire to not only meet around this table, but we should have the desire to please God. We should have the desire to be worthy of everything that we do within these four walls and to meet around this table. The definition of desire, it says, is a strong wanting. We should strongly want to please God. And to meet around this table to do as we were commanded, we should desire to be here around this table. When you got up in the morning, and you made your morning coffee, and you took your shower, did you have desire to be here right now? When this evening comes around, if the Lord doesn't come back, and we haven't closed our eyes in death, are you going to have the desire to be here this evening? The desire to be here on Wednesday? When Paul talks about taking this supper in a worthy manner, that's how we take this supper in a worthy manner. Having the desire to please God, having the desire to say thank you for that sacrifice you made. He goes on to say, For I say unto you, I will no more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and break it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. He had the desire to meet around that table with his disciples, and he had the desire to go to that cross for every single one of us sitting here, for all those in the past and all those in the future until he comes back. He truly knew every single one of us needed his blood to be shed. He knew the suffering that he had to come, and he willingly went to that cross. 
Now, with the desire that we should have, as the men come around, dwell on our state before we were Christians and the future we have ahead of us. And I'll ask the elders to pray. Each and every one of us lead the way after this point. Help us all to be good and do your will each day and be a free end. Help us to walk a little closer with you each day. We just come now around the table this morning. We pray that you'll be with us as we take of this bread. This body that is broken upon that cross for us. For as oft as we do partake of this, we do so as we proclaim. Most of all, thank you for having to die upon the cross for us. We just pray that you'll continue to be with us throughout the service this morning and throughout the day. Continue to be in the presence of God upon this morning upon this earth. Help us always to be faithful to you and serving the Lord of Christ. Just be with us now as we prepare. Go with us and forgive us of our sins and mistakes. In Jesus' name we pray. Father in heaven, as we continue in prayer, we are indeed thankful for this day, for the wonderful blessings you give us each day of our lives, O Lord. Thank you for the privilege to be in your house this morning. We ask God that we'll always uplift your name and praise you for all things, O Lord. We pray, Father, that you'll be with us now as we come around your table. Thank you for this cup, which is your son's shed blood. We pray, Father, that you bless our service today. Be with Red as he brings our message. Thank you so much for him and his family. Thank you for each one here, Lord. We ask God that you'll forgive us of our sins now. Help us always trust in your word and trust in you. It's my prayer in your son's name. Amen.
We now have an opportunity to give back to God, and one of the things that we've been studying in uh, Sunday school class is the ten times that um, Israel rebelled or complained, didn't listen to God while they were in the wilderness, and one of the things that God provided for them when they were hungry was the manna, and he said that if you were a fat guy like me, you'd have enough to be full. If you were a skinny guy like Jonah, he would have enough to be full, and if you got more because you thought you needed more rather than what you really needed, It would rot. It would turn to worms, and it was nasty. God knew exactly what we need. Many times we think we need more than what we do, but God provides for us. He provided for them even though they rebelled against him, and he provides for us even though there's many times we rebel against him. So remember to have the faith that God is the ultimate father, and he'll provide for his children in any way that we need, maybe not the way we desire. And I'll ask Jimmy if he'll pray for the offering. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, God, we do thank you, Father, for all that you do for us. We thank you for everything you provide for us, Father. And Father, we ask today, Father, that you be with each and every one that's here sitting around this table today, Father. And as we receive this offering, Father, we ask that you bless it and it's in you. And Father, have us in this offering the way you have us in this, Father, so that we can win. Father, go with us, watch over us, and guide us. And forgive us when we fail you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Uh, Before we get started this morning, I'd like to have a huge sorry for Mr. Roger here. Um, Dad said he's a huge bandwagon with uh, his tie today. And I'd like to say, Dad, to stand up, please. Dad's actually uh, an Alabama fan, and I've never seen a a bandwagon who loses before till now. So... (laughs) So, Roger, I'm sorry, <laughs> but this morning for the opening scripture is going to be on Matthew, the 25th chapter, in verses 31 through 33. It says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Good morning. It is good to be with you this morning. I'm trying to see if I've got my thing on here. Let's see. Now, I believe our battery's completely dead, so... We'll just worry about it another time. I'll stand right here in front of the microphone like this. Uh, it's, it's just one of those days, isn't it? It's just one of those days. If you will, let's open our Bibles this morning. We're glad you're here to Luke. If you'll get me a thing of batteries up here in this pulpit, I will uh, change them and uh, have them close to me, please. Because I know that getting back and forth, if I move away, yes. Yeah, but it would cut, it cut off as soon as it did once. So. Luke, the 13th chapter. 
Luke, the 13th chapter. We're in the Lord's house. We've had six days to prepare to be here, haven't we? Amen. You've had six days to get your heart and your mind right for ready to worship. Uh, you've had six days to be prepared for whatever we do in this house so that we do not humiliate the Lord. I can't imagine standing up here and just all of a sudden decide that I was going to preach a message I preached five years ago or that I'd never preached or even looked up before because we're here to please the Lord in everything that we do. And that starts with you preparing the days before Sunday gets here. We changed our invitation hymn, page 321 in the Red Hardback book, please. Page 321. Uh, didn't was telling me she has trouble seeing those notes on that little book, and I thought, ah, you'll be all right, till I tried to read the words. So that little words I couldn't see too good, so we changed the hymn of invitation, page 321 in the red hardback book. Luke, the 13th chapter, verse 22. This goes right along with what we've talked about a few times here about preparation, about being prepared. If you ain't preparing for the worship service, if you ain't preparing heart and mind and whatever you're involved in in the worship service to make sure it's the best that you can do, then you ain't going to be prepared when the Lord comes back. I can promise you that. He don't take half-hearted nothing for nothing. So if you've not prepared all week for whatever you're involved in in this worship service, if you've not prepared your heart and mind all week to come in and to worship him in truth and in spirit, you won't be prepared when the Lord comes back. I can assure you that because the Bible tells me so. Luke, the 13th chapter, verse 22, and he went through the cities and the villages teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem, then said one unto him, Lord, are there few? that be saved and Jesus said unto them strive to enter at the straight gate strive what strive show you strive shows effort does it not ain't that what the word means strive means to make a little effort don't give me just what half hearted uh, effort that you've got or a little time here and there strive Means to give some effort. We got some football players in this uh, uh, auditorium tonight, today. We got some good football players. There's some good football and baseball players, good football and basketball. And everything that they were ever good in, I can promise you, they become good because they strove to be good. They didn't just become good. They didn't please the coaches. They didn't please the fans by just, well, we'll just do it however. Not show up for practice today and uh, go in and play the game Friday. Don't go that way, does it? But yet, we try to do our salvation. We try to do the Lord that way. We don't strive to be perfect in nothing. And yet think that at the end, everything's going to be okay. He said, strive to enter at the straight gate for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter and shall not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and has shut the door, ye begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open it to us. And he's going to answer and say, I don't know who you are. I know now not which, who, where you come from. What your name is. Then shall you begin to say, but Lord, we've eaten and we've drunk in your presence. And you've taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I don't know who you are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping, gnashing of teeth. When ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. And you yourselves been rejected, thrust out. Mm, that's going to be a time. 
and they shall come from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south, but they will sit in the kingdom of God, though they not be Jews, though they not be of Israel. They'll be in the kingdom of God. Behold, those that are last shall be first, and there are first which shall be last. All of you've got children. Uh, I know J.K. being here with us can relate. We all tell our children that there's opportunities everywhere. And any time a door shuts before us, be patient, the Lord will open another door. If it didn't work out, it wasn't meant to be. There'll be another opportunity coming, another door to open. That's usually always the truth, unless it's the door of the ark. Once that door shut, it didn't open again, did it? There was not an opportunity. If you go home today and you read in Genesis, the seventh chapter, it says that they began coming uh, to the ark, two by two, male and female, not male and male, not two females. That'd be kind of queer. They came male and female, two by two, and entered in. Noah, his wife, three sons, their three wives. And then it says something very important. It says, then the Lord shut the door. What no doors opening up that day. For those left outside the ark, John, there were no more opportunities for them as we read and study anything that had the breath of life breathed into it, if it was outside the door of the ark, it died. It was destroyed. It perished. I want you to hold with your bulletin or lasso, whatever you've got, Luke the 13th chapter, as we'll flip back and forth uh, this morning. Look at verse 24 with me. Verse 24 says, To strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many I say unto you will enter, seek to enter in, but shall not be able. This door, this gate, this way is narrow. It's Dale, barely big enough for me and you to get through it. It's that narrow. Matthew said in the 7th chapter, to enter through at the straight gate, the narrow. Many be try to enter in the other way, but they're not going to be able to get there. No matter how hard they try. It is the narrow way. It is that narrow gate, that narrow door that leads to life. And then if you paid attention to our study or our reading and our scripture this morning, it says here that the entrance through the door is controlled by the owner of the house. Is that true where you live? I determine who comes in and out of my house, don't you? We don't just leave it open for anybody to come through, stranger, crook, criminal, we decide who's coming through the door in our house. Well, I want you to know the Lord's the same way. He decides who's coming in. But in verse 23, you notice Jesus was asked, Lord, are there few that be saved? How many is going to be saved, Jesus? That's the wrong question. It was the wrong question. Jesus said, don't focus on how many are going to be saved. Focus on the way. Is that what he said? He didn't answer their question. Lord, how many will be saved? No. He starts telling us how. He starts telling us the way to salvation. And as we know, as John 14th chapter verse 6 says, Jesus says, I am the way, 
I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Boy, that the word's important, through is. You can't get to God. You can't get through the door into the house unless you've gone through Jesus Christ. And I want you to understand you don't pray through him. You don't believe through Jesus to salvation. Your faith or belief leads you to repent as Jesus commanded and then straightway the same hour of the day, the same hour of the night, you are immersed. Where Paul says in Galatians, the third chapter, that when he is immersed, Galatians 3.21, we're baptized into Jesus Christ. There meaning his blood that washes our sins away, risen out of baptism as a Christian then to walk in newness of life. We've been put through Jesus, delivered to God. That's how we're saved. That's the only way the Bible teaches we're saved. Although most people say all paths lead to heaven. All paths, all faiths, all churches, all ways. I remember is that Barack Obama, you know what a genius he was. He said that it'd be a pond or a river or a lake or called many different things, but all had water in it. And that all beliefs have truth. I know it's a lie. I know it's a lie. Because if you're not accepting the New Testament of Jesus Christ in its entirety, you have no truth in you. Not the pieces and the parts, but that in its entirety. Proverbs, the 14th chapter, verse 12 says, There's a way that seems right unto man. Seems that's okay. Seems that to be accepted by God. But the way thereof and the end thereof is what? It's damnation. It's death. It's destruction. God says there's one truth. There's one way. That there's one church. There's one Lord. There's one faith. There's one baptism. That's what God says in his word. And that truth is the only thing that leads to him, that gets you through the door. Verse 25. Verse 25. When once the master of the house has risen up and has shut the door, you begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he shall answer and say, I don't know who... You are. Now I understand that what Jesus is talking about is the kingdom to come and the fact that the Gentiles were going to be brought in because the Jews rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it applies to us today that our Christians or that are sitting here and that we're not Christians. Because we're going to think because we had a mere knowledge of Jesus that we'd seen his word, heard his word, knew of his miracles, that that's going to get us into heaven because we believe in Jesus Christ. But he says you're going to come. You're going to come to the door of this house, and the only ones that get in are the prepared. Did you hear me? The only ones that get through the door are the ones that prepared to get through the door. It's just like the ones that prepare to win in life have a better odds of a good outcome than those that have no preparation at all. Is that not what Solomon told us in Proverbs over and over and over? The slothful, they lay around all good planting season long. They don't lift their finger to do anything. Come the winter, guess what? They're starving to death. They weren't prepared. Only the prepared enter through the door of the house. And this door is open. It's accessible to all them that know the Lord, to know the ruler, the owner of the house. The door is always open. You see, you have the way 
the way. Those that prepare and live by the word, the rules, the commands of God, you've got those of the way, then you've got the wayward. The wayward, they follow their own way. They follow their own traditions. They follow their own truths. They follow their own God. But it's only those that are prepared in the way that are able to walk through the door of the house. Jesus explains that though they may know of God, they may acknowledge God, they know something about him, they don't accept his way. And when you go to knock on the door and won't in, he's going to say, I don't know who you are. Where did you come from? But John, we were in a large room and you were eating over there. She eat with us. You walked down the street preaching and teaching. We heard you. You were in our town. We know you. We should come in. He said, I ain't got a clue who you are. That's what it's going to be for a lot of people. They're going to think, well, I come to church on most Sunday mornings. I've bought it once or twice a year. I'd tithe. I was definitely there tithing on Easter Sunday. I was doing this and I was doing that. Lord, you should know who I am. See, they're the wayward. They didn't prepare to meet the Lord. And they truly had no idea who he was. Verse 26 and 27, Then shall you begin to say, We've eaten drunk in your presence. You've taught in our streets. And he say, I'm telling you. I don't know who you are, but he don't stop there. He says, depart from me, you worker, workers of iniquity. Just listening to Jesus, just admiring Jesus is not enough to get you through the door. Just claiming to have a knowledge or an understanding or a belief is not enough to get you through the door. You know, Jesus said in Mark the 7th chapter, he said, rightly, Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, just like it's written, you honor me with your lips, with your mouth, but your heart is far removed from me because you don't keep my commandments, because you don't keep the commandments and the teachings of God. Instead, you instill or install your own traditions and your own truths and your own ways. Regardless of how many would be saved, Jesus said that many will try to enter but won't get in. He said in Luke, the sixth chapter, verse 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say to do? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say to do? And that's what he's going to ask him when they come to his door. And if you're not a faithful, obedient follower to the New Testament of Jesus Christ, call him Lord, Lord, all you want to. And the end, he's going to say, I don't know you. Depart, you worker of iniquity. You see, the Pharisees were convinced that they themselves were righteous because of their bloodline, because of who they were, because of the power they felt they had. But Jesus said they neglected the law. He said, you, you've neglected justice. You've neglected peace and mercy and faithfulness. And you continue to follow after your own agenda. Is that a problem with Christians today? Oh, we're saved, we love Jesus, we love the Lord, but we've got our own agenda. That's a problem in most of our sister churches today. They don't have this anymore. They got their own agenda. They got their own truths. They got their own parts of the truth that they will and will not preach or teach. And this is the same problem the Pharisees had when Jesus was here. Go with me to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, the third chapter. In 
In 2 Timothy, the third chapter, Paul speaking to Timothy says, This know also, that in the last days, and we've been in the last days for 2,000 years, we're not waiting on it to start, it's not waiting on signs and wonders, for all of a sudden, I had a guy call me that day, nice as he could be, want to start talking about the rapture and the left behind part, and I think, Lord God, give me, give me strength there. We've been in the last days for 2,000 years. In the last days, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, which Paul had said was idolatry. Boasters, proud. Blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers. They have no control of their emotions or their ways. They're fear, fierce despisers of those that are good. We see a lot of that today, don't we? If you're good and you try to be good, boy, they despise you, don't they? Anyway, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Here's the next five words that are important. Having a form of of what? They got a form of godliness. There's a form to them about it. But they deny the power thereof. From such turn away from them. What power are they denying? This. And when they reject pieces and parts and teaching of pieces and parts, they reject the power thereof. Though they have a form of godliness, Paul says, turn away from them if you want to get through the door. If you want to be known by the owner of the house, turn away, prepare she can get through the door. Matthew the seventh chapter said, not, not, not everybody that says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, only those that have been obedient to the will of my Father. The vast majority will stand before God, Lord, Lord. Jimmy and Bobby and all kinds of the famous ones on TV for decades, they're going to stand before God and say, Lord, Lord, we preach to the millions and the billions. He's going to say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. They had a form of godliness, but because they denied the word of the living God, they will be cast away. Lesson today, once the door is shut, it's too late. Long time, there's a warning going on about the flood coming. Every time Mark, if they took a wooden spike and a mallet and they drove two pieces of wood together on that ark, every time a, a timber fell and it was prepared for that ark, there was a sermon went out that you better be prepared. Everything that went on during that time was a message from God. But when he shut the door, the invitation was over. And there wasn't nobody opening the door back up. Those unknown will be rejected. How could those that think they know Jesus be rejected by him? You ever wonder about that? A lot of righteous acting people. I talk to people, goodness, all the time. They've read their Bibles through 5, 10, 15 times. Yet they don't know what to do to be saved or how to live a faithful life. But they claim to know Jesus. And then when our story here, it says he, they're going to be rejected. And that that salvation's open to all. Don't matter your background, don't matter your bloodline, don't matter white, black, male, female, rich, poor, nothing else. You got to remember the door don't just open because you have some loose association with Jesus Christ. The door doesn't open because of how you feel in your heart. 
the door opens depend on whether the man of the house knows who you are. And if he doesn't know who you are, you're rejected. Don't matter how you feel in your heart. Don't matter what kind of association or relationship you think you have with the master of the house. You got to come to God through his terms. You got to come to Jesus Christ through his terms. Not a Bible college's terms. Not this theory or that theory or this study or that study or this reverend or father or rabbi or none of them. But by Jesus' way. It's his rules. They own the house. To find the door, you got to have found Christ. You had to have found Jesus. To know the way means you've got to know Jesus. John 1.14 says, He is the Word. This isn't just red letters and black letters on some white paper. It says this word is Jesus Christ. And Jesus told those apostles, it's a good thing that I die and get this over with and go on because when I do, I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit. And he's going to live within you and he's going to teach you and direct you and the words you speak you don't need to worry about. But he didn't stop there. He said, I want you to know that whatever he teaches you, whatever he tells you to say, it's not of his own will, his own words. It's what I tell him to tell you. So when you read and study the New Testament of Jesus Christ and you reject pieces or parts or any piece or part of it, understand you have rejected Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You do not know the owner of the home and he does not know you. Is that not sad? The vast majority of people we know, our family, our friends, co-workers, people we go to school with, think they know the owner of the house. Thinks the owner of the house knows them. But that is not true. No matter how they feel about it. We must be known of Jesus Christ. Even Jesus' own words in Mark 16, 16, he said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Jesus said that. Yet the world teaches he that believes saved. He that believes and is not baptized is saved. Don't even have to believe anymore to be saved. As long as you can bring in some money and put an offering plate, we'll get you to heaven. But the apostles are very, very clear in their teaching. It's only in the blood of Jesus Christ can our sins be removed from us. It's only in the blood of Jesus Christ can we know the owner of the house that will open the door. And we only meet that blood in immersion when you come as a repentant sinner being immersed in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. Today, the door's open. Today, it's open. High noon, Sunday morning, the door's open. That doesn't mean the door don't close for you in five minutes after 12. We, we live with a bunch of, we, we live around a bunch of nuts. Thank God I ain't in Chicago or California, different kind of nuts. Everybody's crazy anymore. And they can't drive a lick, John. You don't know when the door shuts is my point. It's open through the blood of Jesus Christ today. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation 321 in your red hardback book. I want you to listen to the words of this song. I want you to listen to what it says. He's begging you don't spurn the invitation. This means nothing right now. If you're outside Jesus Christ, you're locked out and the door is closed. But his invitation is to you today. But through his mercy and love, he sent Jesus to die for your sins.
He made a way for his blood to remove everything you've ever done wrong in your life and to be able to stand before him spotless.